Hello, and welcome to the Charles River Conservancy Parkland Show. My name is Renata von Scharner. I'm the founder and president of the Charles River Conservancy. And this show is always about our wonderful Charles, about Cambridge, and how the two, the river and the city, how they interact, of how they have played a key role in each other's lives. And today's show is a very special show. It's about the history of Cambridge. And I have with me today, Ted Clark. Welcome. Thank you. Ted Clark, you, I would call, he was really a, a amateur historian, actually not so amateur. He has written 19 history books and biographies. So he, you have studied a lot of history and he was a teacher. He was the chairman of the Weymouth Historical Commission. So um, we are very fortunate to have Ted Clark with us here today. He has just finished, just published a book about the Charles River. And we're going to hear some um, parts of that book, uh, particularly the parts that pertain to Cambridge. And as you, as you know, we cover the area from the harbor up to the Watertown Dam. And in fact, many, many of the stories in, in the book um, cover uh, both the harbor area with the new area in Cambridge, as well as the more historic parts around Harvard Square, Brattle Street, and Tory, Tory Row. Um, this is the cover of the book, a wonderful picture um, that um, of the cover. And I understand you not only wrote the book, but you also you also took the pictures of the book. That's right. That was a lot of fun too. Yes, and. You started um, the the book with um, of, at the mouth of the Charles, with Charlestown and Boston, and then Cambridge, and then you travel up the river, and at the end of the book you come back to Cambridge. So Cambridge really frames the book in many ways. Um, so I would love for you to kind of get us going on. Um, on some of the very earliest his earliest history of the of the Charles River, and we have a map here, uh, a historic map, and you might want to tell us a bit about uh, the map and the map maker and how um, he is relevant for Cambridge and the Charles River. I'd love to start there. In fact, I think John Smith is a good place to start any story of history of the early colonies. John Smith is mainly known for his travels in Virginia and being part of the colony at Jamestown. But he's much more than that. He was an adventurer, a soldier of fortune, and a map maker, the best probably map maker of his era. And he charted uh, the coast of most of what is now in the northern part of the northeastern part of the United States and maps of New England. And he traveled far and wide. And uh, he not only wrote, but he was sort of a travel writer too. Besides making the maps, he would tell about the places that he visited. And he told them from the point of view of someone who might like to come there and start a colony or join a colony. So he was uh, sort of a PR person yeah. as well. Or, or as somebody once described him, he, he was a venture capitalist. He was, he was trying to sell um, the Charles River, that was became the Charles River, as a destination. And yes. he, had, he, he made some major promises there. He did. And uh, in fact, I should mention before I forget to, that on his map, he used a lot of Indian names. He knew a lot of Indians and met a lot of them, and he named places for them. However, he did not have the final word on what the place names would be. He had to run it by his boss, who was Prince Charles, later Charles I of England. And when Charles I saw all those Indian names, he didn't think that was such a great idea. He changed most of them to English names. For example, he changed the uh, Cape on the north of Boston to the name of his mother, Cape Anne. Mm -hmm. He changed the, uh, the river, which was called Massachusetts after the local Indian tribe. That's what John Smith had called it. Charles called it Charles River, which seemed like a better name to him for some reason. Yeah, he was, he was made to believe that this river would take him all the way to, to, to gold and, and big riches. Well, he understandably thought that. 
In fact, an earlier explorer, just a little bit earlier, was uh, Champlain, the French explorer, and they both made the same mistake, standing off ship in their sail offshore in their sailing vessels. They looked at the Charles, they saw the broad basin, as we would call it. They couldn't see much beyond that, so they thought it was a great river in the sense of something that emptied the waters from a continent. And in fact, that's not the case. It quickly diminishes in size, but that, uh, that falsehood or that false impression that Smith got and he wrote about also had something to do with Cambridge becoming more important early than it might have. So let's, let's go on to a, a map of, of Cambridge, mm -hmm. um, a very early map. We are now in 1635. So John Smith, he arrived here even earlier than that. 1614. Yeah. So here we have an early map of Cambridge. Um, help us find our way here uh, where we are. Mm -hmm. um, we, as we, we are here in a, on Mass Avenue, but um, what the settlement mostly was around Harvard Square there. Yes, well, the, um, the Puritans, most people don't realize the Puritans were very logical people, very thorough. They planned everything out. And in fact, they were also very worried about uh, warfare and hostilities because they'd come from England and had been embroiled in the middle of several wars of that type. So when they started their settlement, it began in Salem. They walked from there to Charlestown, where they found the water wasn't very good. So they acted on an invitation from a man whose name was Blackstone, who lived in Boston and had fine water, and they came across to visit him. But they were a little bit worried about Boston being the, the locus or capital of their settlement because it was right there by the ocean. There were Indian tribes around who may have been hostile. So they started talking about it. And of course, the governor at that time was Governor John Winthrop. And he was, uh, he was a planner himself. And he said, maybe we should move the capital upstream. Uh, there's a place called Newtown, which is what they called it Cambridge then. It's about five miles upriver, and at that point, the, the river gets narrow, and a sailing ship from the French or the Spanish could probably not navigate it. So that would be a good place for us to seat our capital. Mm -hmm. And the area near, Charles, uh, near Harvard Square, today's Harvard Square, at the uh, end of JFK Street is where they had the uh, fording and where they began the settlement. And being the planners they were, they planned out a town and they got people to come there. And the early settlement was around Harvard Square and they had streets designed and they decided to make it a trading center for the outlying towns to bring things and sell them and then they would be transferred to Boston. Yeah. So that's how that got started. Yeah, well, um, I want us to move along in a little bit into, into the history about a place called uh, Fort Washington. So um, Fort Washington is, um, we have a picture here as it looks today. So take us back to when this fort was actually used in a military fashion and um, what happened there? Well, of course, this all had to do with George Washington who became commander in chief and took charge of the forces here in Cambridge. Uh, the story is that it took place under the Washington Elm, but that's really not uh, proven. But uh, Washington was a man who's from his early soldierhood, if I can use that word, was very interested in fortifications. And when he came to the Boston area, when he came to Cambridge, <clears throat> where the soldiers who would be working for him were in, ensconced in uh, Harvard College, in the barracks, in the, what are now the dormitories, and um, as he took place, the first thing he wanted to see were the fortifications. And there were several, but they weren't very good ones in his view. So he decided to build his own. He built a couple of small forts up by the intersection of Putnam Avenue. And he built this one called Fort Washington, which I think is on Waverly Street. It's in the Cambridgeport area. And it, at the time, it rose on a, a height above the Charles River. So it could be fortified and the guns of the type you see there uh, could be used on any enemy vessel. So Fort Washington still exists. It's now a city park for Cambridge yeah. and you can go and visit it and it's quite interesting. And then across the river, uh, of course, in, in Brooklyn, Brookline, 
um, there was the fort there, and, and there was more action there, wasn't there? That was the other fort that he built, across by Cottage Farm. Uh, you probably all know the, the Boston University Bridge, but it used to be called the Cottage Farm Bridge. It's really the same bridge with some improvements. And in that area, that's where the river goes from the wide basin to a narrow one because it has to sort of hook a curve towards the north. If you picture it in your mind's eye, it sort of goes upstream there and it gets narrow and any vessel coming, say a foreign warship, would have to slow down. So Washington being the military genius he was, said that's a perfect place for a fort. And he built Fort Brookline. Now, of course, when Cambridge was to be made the capital, which it was not, but when it was considered for the capital, one of the reasons was because enemy warships couldn't get by there very readily. And they were thinking of Spanish or French or something else. In fact, it were British ships who actually did the attacking. And this was just after the Battle of Bunker Hill. They sent a squadron down the Charles River Basin through Back Bay, which at that time was full size, not like it is now. Back Bay extended to where the Museum of Fine Arts is, inland, and as far as Kenmore Square, inland. So it was very wide there. And then just as they wanted to make that hook and go to the north, there was the fort. Mm -hmm. uh, the British decided they could attack it by sending some barges with cannon on board. They had 24 pound cannon. They sent it, they were able to send those barges to within 300 yards of the fort and they started to cannonade it. Uh, the people who were manning the fort for Washington put out all the lights and fires and everything else, made it total darkness, and the cannonading was not successful. Hmm. They didn't have a good target, so they sailed away and they never came back. That was the only attack, but it is a little known fact of history and it took place just a few miles from here. It was wonderful. Well, I want us to um, focus on a, on a building um, where Washington actually also lived and, and many others. So I'd like us to um, look at that building and, and its various residents. It's really, it comprises so much of Cambridge's history. It's the uh, Craigie Longfellow House. It was first of all the vassal house because the builder of the house was a seaman, a trader, who made his fortune in trading with the West Indies and he built that. He wanted a good view of the river and this house had at that time a clear view, nothing but a lawn between it and the river. And uh, Vassal lived there for a few years and he was followed by other rich merchants. And then during the revolution, uh, just before the actual revolution, John Glover, who was the colonel from Marblehead, who was the well-known sailor who helped Washington to cross uh, the, the, uh, the river to, to attack Trenton, and he got him out of a lot of other scrapes. He uh, occupied the house for a short while and his men slept outside in tents on the lawn. And then George Washington himself, when he came to Cambridge, used it for his quarters. His men, as noted, were at Harvard College, just a short distance away, and he held his meetings there and his staff headquarters was there. In fact, he even brought Martha in from Mount Vernon and they had their anniversary there on January 12, 1776. A big party and one of the first of many that were held in that house. Mm. And, and so he, uh, it was more than just a headquarters. He, he lived there for a while. Yes, he did. Yeah. He lived there and it was there that uh, he sent Benedict Arnold, who was at that time a good guy. He sent him on his attack through Maine to attack uh, Montreal and Quebec City. And he also unmasked Colonel, I'm sorry, Dr. Church, Dr. Benjamin Church, who had been a British spy uh, posing as an American uh, helper, mm -hmm. American side, a patriot. And uh, he had evidence that showed that Church was in fact a traitor. Yeah, and yeah. it happened there. Well, I, um, what, what makes this book so fascinating is that you obviously you have the knowledge about all these stories, but the way you tell those stories is, is particularly um, intriguing uh, for the reader because you, you bring it, you tell these anecdotes. You, I mean, they, you could write a history of Cambridge for several hundred pages, but you extract particularly um, interesting stories. Um, so um, what, when I read your book and I was then, um, walking by this building, suddenly 
I saw all those various historical uh -huh. figures come alive. So you have, have really succeeded in, in extracting stories that are memorable and, and fun to, to learn about. So tell us about some other residents of that building. Well, in addition to Glover and Washington, of course, uh, there was Andrew Craigie. Andrew Craigie was the man who built a bridge uh, near the current bridge, or actually the predecessor to the bridge that now crosses the Charles at the Museum of Science. Which is still called the Craigie Bridge. Called the Craigie by Bridge. By some people, yes. Yes. And uh, he built it so that he could, uh, he found that all those bridges brought more residents to Cambridge. In fact, if you look at the bridges and you look at the highways, uh, they cut diagonally through Cambridge to the major population centers. And he thought that by building the bridge and building some buildings around it and offering land for sale, that he could make a fortune. And for a while, he did pretty well. He had some money to start with, and he did pretty well. Uh, there's a story about he changed the house by adding an L and a wonderful garden, and he would have these parties there. He brought in furniture from out of town and out of the country. And one day, at one of these parties, he was walking with a friend in the garden. And uh, the friend said, boy, you've done a lot with this house. You must be a very happy man. And he said, well, I would be, except you see those two young women walking ahead of us? I'm in love with one of them, and I'd like to marry them, marry her. But uh, she's engaged to somebody else. Well, when the friend heard this, he went and he broke up that marriage. And he came that, back. That, that uh, fiancé. That, that fiancé. Yeah, yes, that's right. That, it yeah. was a young college grad who was, she was engaged to, and he broke it up, and he said, all right, Mr. Craigie, now you, the coast is clear. But he had asked the wrong father of the wrong girl. There was a second girl. That was the one that uh, Longfellow, I'm sorry, yes, uh, Craigie had the crush on. And he managed to break up that marriage, too, and he married Elizabeth, who became Elizabeth Craigie. Uh, they lost all their money, and... Uh, she finally uh, became a widower, and she still owned a house. That's about all that was left to her. And she rented out rooms. And one of the people she rented a room to was a young college professor by the name of Longfellow. Oh, and now we're coming to yet another person there. Yes. Longfellow, of course, was a poet, but he was also a professor at Harvard. And uh, he, would, uh, he would write in some of his best poetry in that house. He wrote, uh, in fact, the... Uh, Tale of Paul Revere and the Minutemen and all that went on there, which most people take as straight history, even though it's not. And uh, he also wrote uh, Evangeline while he was in that house. But there was also a, a tragedy in his life and in the life of the house, you might say. His wife was killed there. Uh, she was in sleeping or in the next room to him. He was sleeping. And uh, she had a candle and the candle dripped wax, hot wax on her dressing gown and caught fire and she yelled out and he came after he woke up of course and he uh, tried to put the fire out with a rug but he wasn't very good at it and the next day she died from it mm. and he was just badly burned and that's the reason that he wears the uh, beard that we see him in because his face was so scarred from mm. it. Incidentally speaking of Longfellow there's two other little facts that are interesting. We talked about bridges and the West Boston Bridge was named for Longfellow because, now called the Longfellow Bridge, because he, uh, he would take that road to go to Beacon Hill, where his next lover was. Her name was uh, Fanny Appleton, and she lived on Beacon Hill, and she was the daughter of one of the men who started the uh, Boston Mechanical Works at, at Waltham mm. on the Charles. And uh, when they finally got married, she refused him many times, when they finally got married, uh, the father, Nathan Nathaniel Appleton, bought them the house, the Craigie house, as a wedding gift. Ah. And he also bought the land between there and the river so that no one else could occupy it. Yes. Well, the other fact on Longfellow, he was also a translator. And one of the things he translated was Dante's Divine Comedy. And in time, he started what was called the, the Dante Club. And of course, a local resident by the name of Pearl wrote a fiction story on the Dante Club, which is quite good, and which was on the bestseller list for many years. And it has all the main characters, Longfellow and all his professor friends in it. And I recommend that reading. Yeah, so there are all these connections also to the river. What we are looking here is a view out of the Longfellow house towards the river. 
and um, we can't see the river because of the trees but as you say at the time this was an open vista um, down to the river mm -hmm. um, through Longfellow Park down to the other side um, which is Soldier's Field. Um, I, don't, I don't know if your book contains the story of how Soldier's Field got its name but Longfellow was involved in that in that as well. Um, so we have all these stories with Craigie um, being connected with the Craigie Bridge and the, the river, George Washington with the forts on both Cambridge and in Brookline. So we have, we have a lot of the, the personalities in this, in this house where many of them were involved with the Charles River in, in one way or another. I should also mention, and I think you mentioned this to me in a conversation, that uh, there's another bridge that comes into the story. Mm. When the British came to attack uh, Concord and Lexington, they crossed through Cambridge going out. And they crossed the bridge at what is now JFK Street. It was called the Great Bridge and was built in 1660. And today it's the Anderson Bridge. The Lars yeah. Anderson Bridge. And they crossed that and marched off to Lexington and then to Concord. And of course they had to return the same way and expected to go home over that bridge, which was much shorter by about five miles than any other route. But when they got to the bridge, they found the planks had all been removed by Cambridge citizens, Sons of Liberty and other patriots. And they were so systematic that they numbered the planks so that when the British had gone on their way through Charlestown, they put the planks back in the right order. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. So if, if I think you have many more reasons now that you know all these stories to go and visit that house. It's a house that belongs to the National Park Service, has wonderful tours, a wonderful garden, and it's, it's open to the public and it's, it's definitely a place where, where you want to visit. And, um, but make sure you read the book first. Um, by Ted Clark, because you will see this building in a very in a very different way afterwards. So let's go um, a little bit up the river. Um, Cambridge is at the horizontal part of the river, but your book actually covers the entire river, although Cambridge probably takes up about 20%, so there's, it's a wonderful par big part of the book is about Cambridge. So let's wander a little bit up the river and um, where would you like to stop well, first? Why don't we start at the beginning, which is Hopkinton. And most Bostonians know Hopkinton for another reason, which is the Boston Marathon starting place. So Hopkinton is well known, the Charles is well known, and they meander on sort of the same course as they head towards Back Bay in Boston. And in fact, the, uh, the river is crossed by the marathon runners at least once, and you could count twice if you count uh, mm -hmm. Charles View or Charles the little river that goes over by the Fenway there. That's mm -hmm. another one. But uh, another town that's interesting is Natick. In South Natick, there was an Indian tribe who were tended to by Charles Eliot, Reverend Eliot. And uh, they were a tribe of Christian con converts, Indians who had been converted to Christianity. The church building is still there. The bridge is still there. There's a little settlement in South Natick, which is another nice place to visit. Should mention in Natick as well, from a more recent time, there was a, a baseball factory. It was the major baseball factory in the United States. It was uh, the place where they made the baseballs for uh, major league teams. And it had the uh, figure eight design stitched on it, just as it still does. And everything was made by hand, including the bench, which they used to make, fashion these baseballs. The factory is still there. It's now a condominium, but it has a sign on it, so you can find it. It's right near the tea station. Mm. Another town of interest would be uh, uh, Auburndale, where they had all the canoes, great canoeing capital, Norumbega Park. We could mention Waltham, where they started the mill that used the waters of the Charles River yeah. and became uh, quite a strong city at that point. Well, much of your book actually talks about um, the river as an industrial um, is industrial innovation where a lot of mills were there and you tell some wonderful stories of the early factories that go back to the early 17th century. That meant some cleaning up too and uh, groups like the Conservancy and the Charles River Watershed Association have done a great job 
in managing the chows for flood control and clean up and getting rid of the things. They have a wonderful park out in Waltham and Watertown. And uh, in fact, in 2011, the Charles River won the River Prize mm -hmm. for the whole world in competition with many other river systems for its management. Mm. And that's something to be proud of. Yeah, and that is that was the Charles River Watershed Association that got this award and then they, um, so that has been has brought a lot of honor and recognition for the Charles River, which is wonderful. Well, I want to um, make sure that you see the cover again so that you can go and get that book um, in your local bookstore or at Amazon. Uh, it, I had great pleasure reading that book and I hope that you will also get that book. And I'm very grateful for you to come here today and tell us some stories. Thank you for inviting me. And it has been a pleasure having you. And if you just started to watch and you missed it, this show will be on YouTube um, with the Charles River Conservancy. So you can um, see the show um, on YouTube as, may, as well as many other shows about all kinds of different subjects. So thank you, Ted Clark, for coming today. and. Keep telling those wonderful stories. All right, I will. They make great, great. Um, we are very lucky to have you. Thank you very much.